My mother had refused to speak a word to me for three days. This wouldn't feel great in ordinary circumstances, but since she was lying in her bed dying, I was upset, as in angry. This seems inhumane, I know, but for a long time before this early summer day, two years ago, I'd simply decided to accept that loving my mother was painful sometimes. I had just arrived at my parents' house after the 90-minute drive to Philadelphia for the third morning in a row, and I stood at her shoulder and I cried as she refused to greet me yet again. Why, Mama, why? Why won't you talk to me? She just opened her eyes to look at me, closed them slowly, and turned over in bed, giving me her back. For most of the life we shared, my mother and I had been more like sisters, the utterly cinematic vision of mother-daughter closeness. When I was a child, the lack of definition between us was thrilling. For us both, I got to feel precocious and wise, she, young and free. As a unit, we were vivacious, dramatic, and attention-seeking. We entered every room expectantly and might have as well have raised joint hands and said, ta-da! <laughs> Together, we were a highbrow carny performance, charming waiters and shop clerks, or so we imagined, laughing at our own witty observations of the people around us, trying on scarves and jewelry and personas at department store counters. In the evenings, I lay on her bed, she under the covers and me on top, and we communed for hours while my father and brothers circulated outside the bubble the two of us had created. But home was where our connection took on a more earthbound weight. Home was where my mom struggled with her depression, with my short-tempered father, and where she got caught in the eddies of her family history and her sense of not having lived the life that was her destiny. And home is where I learned it was my job to save her and to love her best of all. You are the best thing I ever did, she'd say to me in her saddest hours, palm pressed to my face. I'd quickly shuffle aside the trickle of dread that sentence awakened in me and turn it into a blossoming sense of pride. She and I escaped all we didn't want to see by disappearing into poetry and books, writing and storytelling about ourselves. As I grew up and turned those pastimes into passionate avocations, she came newly alive with the anticipation that I would live the life that she had failed to live for herself. I went away to college in her home state of Virginia, the South's enchanting mists of ancestry further binding us together. In my absence, though, she slipped into an all-consuming depression, and we wrote each other long impassioned letters in which she urged me to live my life to the fullest, and I ministered to her spiraling sense of futility. But in college, I also began to discover who I was without her. I fell in love with bluegrass and grits, part of my mother's country past which she had brushed aside. I met other people who loved words as much as she did. I found my soul in mountains and rivers. At home on breaks, it was obvious to me that my mother was coming undone. My father asked me my counsel. He knew that I knew her best. But I was starting to understand she simply was not whole in herself. As I moved ahead in my life, she started picking fights with me about nothing, our differences in opinion on turkey stuffing or Martha Stewart's prison conviction. <laughs> My mother's attacks became increasingly vicious. You think you're so smart now because you're so successful, such a superstar. And I began to fold up and withdraw from her, casting my eyes to the floor and waiting for her anger to extinguish. She was punishing me for my betrayal, the betrayal of living my life for myself. I knew that's why my mother was turning away from me that morning as she lay dying. But there was beauty in this heartbreak. What my mother was leaving behind in her passage was a message she'd always taken such fervor to impress upon me. Burn through life in your own indomitable way. Be who you are. Live passionately, because life is filled with regrets no matter what. She did have days of clarity. Those were the days that I crawled into bed with her, she under the covers and me on top. I'd caress her arm and cheek, encanting the magical word, Mama, Mama. 
over and over, sharing her bread, her bed, her breath, witnessing her last days as best I could, and letting myself be angry the day she was being cruel. I texted my brothers in a rage those days, and my older brother reminded me that of course she would die as she lived, as will we all. Whether life's regrets become vines that bind you is up to you. But that lesson I had to learn for myself because my mother could not teach it to me.